much appreciated. Especially in the rain. I don't know if it was raining for you, but it was miserable when I got up and dragged myself out of bed this morning. Morning, morning. Okay, so let's kick things off. Uh, so, has been right how, uh, as has been rightly pointed out, uh, for those of you who were here on Monday, um, we sort of got stopped halfway through the sort of working out of how we calculate equilibrium temperatures for spacecraft. So we're going to jump back into that in a minute. Um, and once you have that, you'll be able to go about all the quiz questions, hopefully um, without too much difficulty. But to get your brains warmed up, I'm going to start with a little bit of theory stuff first, and then we'll dump, jump back into the questions, uh, the calculations, because quite frankly, I can't deal with that uh, without another five minutes prep. And I'm sure you can't either. So first thing, uh, which I didn't touch on on Monday, actually, and I thought maybe I should have started with this. But anyway, we're going to start with it today, which is why do we care about spacecraft temperatures? Um, and I've got loads of answers in here. Uh, I think pretty much everyone has got it. Um, <laughs> uh, not to test for COVID, whoever said that. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, I do appreciate the chuckle first thing in the morning. Um, so, uh, however, I think one particular answer sums it up really nicely. So I'm just going to read it out to you, which is so none of our components overheat. Any component that overheats hot enough or for long enough, your component basically dies. This can harm or kill other components and can render your fancy schmancy spacecraft nothing more than a cooked piece of junk. Right, which I think sums it up. We've got lots of sensitive equipment inside our spacecraft, um, and if they get too hot or too cold, they can break, basically. It's as simple as that. Um, so this is an example from a spacecraft that I worked on uh, a few years ago now. Um, and these were the operating temperatures. I appreciate it's a little bit small for you, but it is in the, uh, in the slides, obviously. Um, so these, this is how you would normally look at the thermal limits of each of your spacecraft components. So you tend to break them down by each of the different elements inside your spacecraft. This is a CubeSat, so it's only like a little small 10 by 10 centimeter spacecraft. Obviously, if you've got a big spacecraft, there's a lot more components on board, probably more complex instruments that you need to worry about, but this is quite a simple example. Um, what you'll notice is what we've got here are two bounds. So we've got the uh, operational temperature limits, and then we've got the survival temperature limits. So if you buy a component to go on a spacecraft, it will tell you what these limits are. Um, and basically, once you get outside that operating limit, your component will stop working. right? So it'll, it won't be able to operate. It'll shut off. If you get outside your survival limits, then it will break. Um, and it won't be able to turn back on. Yeah, so obviously you don't ideally want to go outside your operating range because you want your spacecraft to function, um, but you definitely don't want to go outside your survival range because at that point your, your spacecraft is going to be unrecoverable. Um, the, what you'll notice here is that, and this is the case for most spacecraft, is that the thing with the most tight bounds of operation and survivability is the battery. So in the same way that I don't know if any of you have ever had your phone in a very cold country, that quite often if you take it out, try and take photos in something like minus 10, minus 15, if you leave your phone out in that kind of temperature for a long time, it will just shut down. Batteries do not like being very, very cold, and they don't like being very, very hot. Um, so your batteries tend to be your strictest limits, unless you have uh, what's not included here um, is the instrument. In this spacecraft, we only had quite a simple experiment board, so there wasn't too much complicated things, and we had a camera. Um, but obviously, if you've got a spacecraft with quite uh, a detailed payload, something that maybe includes mirrors and optics, those can be quite sensitive to temperature because they might warp or distort as the temperature increases. So those can be quite limiting as well. But generally speaking, it's either going to be your instrument or it's going to be your battery. Okay, so next question, what are some ways that we could control our spacecraft temperature? And we're going to come back to this at the end of the lecture, but again, just to get you warmed up before we dive back into those calculations. So I'll just give you a couple of minutes to throw some ideas in. Um, we've seen now why it's important. We don't want our spacecraft to get cooked so, uh, or, or freeze. Um, so what, what can we do to help ourselves out? Thinking back to what we looked at on Monday.
Feel free to talk to each other as well. Ideally about this, but you know. Yes? So for the operating and for the limits for a proper operation, if it's exceeded, it stops working properly but can be recovered. Correct. Survival, limit for survival, exceeds risk. Correct. Well summarized, thank you. All right, getting lots of answers coming in here. Um, we'll revisit some of these uh, at the end, as I say, but there's some interesting stuff. Some of them um, you'll see are absolutely right as things that we can do. Someone said open the window. That's not as wrong as you might think it is. <laughs> Someone said draw the curtains. Also not as wrong as you might think it is. Um, the one thing I will address, just because I can see a few people have put it in, is things about fans and air conditioning. Remember, we don't have air. We don't have very many fluids to deal with. So the idea of blowing uh, air across a surface, like you might have in your laptop, obviously, that the fan might come on uh, to cool it, doesn't work in space. So that is one thing that we can't actually um, make use of. So that's just the one thing I'll mention. Are you OK? Are you sure? <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> I'm not sure it was meant to be, but OK. Uh, right. Okay, I think the rest of them are pretty much spot on, um, so we'll uh, revisit those at the end. One thing people have mentioned is position. I don't mention that later on, but that is a good point. Thinking about when you're designing an orbit, where you put your spacecraft, as we talked about, will impact the amount of radiation that it's going to absorb from the, uh, the amount of heat radiation, both from the Earth and from the Sun. Um, and obviously your eclipse will have um, a, an impact on that as well. So you can actually design that straight into your mission rather than having to deal with it when you've got your mission designed and now you've got a spacecraft that's dealing with thermal issues. Uh, so great idea there. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm going to pop on to, whee, ding. Right, we're gonna pop into the hardcore stuff now. So quick recap. On Monday, we looked at uh, the thermal balance equation. So this idea of when we have a spacecraft in orbit and we want to look at uh, its thermal situation, we will take a steady state example, so we pretend that everything is frozen in time, nothing's moving, and we calculate what are the thermal balance equation for that situation. So we imagine that the temperature is steady, the temperature is fixed, which means that the heat coming into the spacecraft has to equal the heat going out, because if more heat was going out, it would cool down, if more heat was coming in, it would heat up, and we're saying that's not happening, it's stabilized. So this was the equation that we ended up with. These were all the different types of thermal energy that our spacecraft might be experiencing coming into it. And this is the expression for the thermal energy going out. And we started off by looking at our solar input and our albedo. And now today we're going to move on to looking at the remainder of these three terms. So we're going to kick off with Earth radiation, which you'll remember is the infrared radiation that is coming from the Earth itself. So the Earth has a temperature. That means that it is giving off heat. Thinking about someone who's just been out for a really, really long run and comes in, if you go and give them a hug, they're quite hot, right? So it's that, it's that idea. They're almost radiating heat out. So our planet has a temperature. Space is cold. So relatively speaking, it is, relative, it is radiating infrared radiation, and our spacecraft absorbs some of that. So something else we mentioned is that this is a lot um, lower in terms of the intensity compared with what we're getting from the sun. So even though if we're at Earth, we're much further from the sun, the solar radiation we were getting was 1,400 watts per meter squared. The infrared radiation that we're getting from the Earth is around 250 watts per meter squared, depending on how far away we are. But this is the kind of ballpark number that we use. Um, so it's a lot, lot lower than what we're getting from the sun. So uh, remembering again that we are dealing with something that is in watts per meter squared, so we need to know the area that this, uh, the, the area of our absorbing surface. So on our spacecraft, where is this infrared heat hitting, and where is it being absorbed? And remembering that this is going to be the face that's looking at the Earth, because the infrared radiation is coming off the Earth. So only that face that is looking at the Earth is going to be absorbing the radiation. And just like in the case of our, um, of our albedo, because that was looking at radiation reflecting off the Earth, we're dealing with the Earth again. So here, once again, we're thinking about the projected area that's looking at the Earth. And we're looking at the view factor that we might have to take into account um, as our spacecraft moves away from the Earth a little bit, thinking about how much of that radiation that leaves the Earth's surface is going to hit the surface of the spacecraft. So those are two terms we covered in albedo. Hopefully they sound familiar. 
but we need to take them into account when we're dealing with the Earth IR as well. So, so far, hopefully nothing new, hopefully all looking okay. The, the difference with Earth IR is the next thing. So, infrared uh, radiation coming from the Earth is not the same wavelength as the radiation coming from the Sun. So when we were thinking about the radiation coming from the Sun, we talked about the absorptivity, so how much of that energy actually gets absorbed into the spacecraft and how much gets reflected away. And we had this term, this alpha term, that told us that absorptivity that we had to take into account. When we were dealing with albedo, we used that absorptivity term again because the light that we were, or the radiation that was hitting our spacecraft in that case was the reflected solar radiation. So it was the same wavelength of light. It had just bounced off the Earth before it got to us. The Earth infrared radiation is different. So the solar radiation tends to cover a very, very wide range of wavelengths. It's kind of like a whole spectrum of wavelengths coming off the sun. However, infrared is only a very narrow portion of that energy spectrum. And so what we'll see is that our alpha, so our absorptivity for the solar radiation, is kind of your average across all of these wavelengths. Whereas when we think about our infrared radiation, we only want the absorptivity for the wavelengths in that infrared range. And so those two values are different. We have a different absorptivity for solar radiation than we do for Earth infrared radiation. Does that make sense? Nodding? Excellent. Good. Okay, it gets worse, but we're on step one. Okay, so two different absorptivity values, one for infrared, one for the whole spectrum of solar radiation. However, it is actually quite difficult to measure how much energy a surface is absorbing for a variety of reasons, but it's quite hard, basically because once it's going into the surface, it's being conducted around, it's moving around within the thing, and so trying to actually measure that value experimentally is quite difficult. However, measuring the emissivity, how much radiation it's giving out, is a much easier thing to do because we know that our spacecraft, if it has a temperature, is only going to be emitting infrared radiation. It's not lighting up. So we can measure how much radiation, how much IR radiation is coming out of our spacecraft quite easily using things like thermal cameras. So we can measure our emissivity for infrared very easily, but we can't measure our absorptivity very easily. Fortunately, there's a nice trick. The trick is that if you have two bodies interacting by which I mean they're not touching, but they're interacting in terms of exchanging thermal energy, and both of those bodies are at about the same temperature, then we can assume the absorptivity and the emissivity are the same. There is a lot of detail in the notes about why this is true based off Kirchhoff's law, so if you're interested, I'd advise you to go and read through it because I think it takes a little bit of time to get your mind used to this. But the long and short of it is that when we're doing a calculation for our Earth infrared radiation, we use the emissivity value, not the absorptivity value. Okay, so when we're thinking about the sun and the solar energy, we use absorptivity. When we're thinking about Earth IR, we use that emissivity. Because the spacecraft, although the temperature might vary, it's never going to get a million miles away from the temperature of the Earth. It's always going to be in it, because we saw what our limits are going to be, right? They were all in and around, like, you know, minus 30 to plus 30 kind of degrees. So, Does that make sense a little? Any questions? Is that a question or a stretch? Okay, that's good. <laughs> well, it's not good. If you have a question, that's absolutely fine too. <laughs> but it'd be an odd, odd way to do it. <laughs> no, everybody happy? Okay. Let's move on to the last bit then, which is reasonably straightforward, this is power dissipation. So this is the last term in our expression in terms of inputs, and this is just basically all of those pieces of equipment that I showed you at the start that have these thermal operating ranges. If they're turned on, they're going to be drawing power, and they're not perfectly efficient because nothing is, so some of that power will be wasted as thermal energy. So if you have something like a computer and it requires one watt of power to run, it might only actually use you know, 0.8 watts of power and, you know, 0.2 watts of power gets dissipated as heat because just due to inefficiencies in the wiring, in, in the way that the processors are running and so on. So we need to account for that uh, energy. 
Um, and obviously, even when the power is moving through each of these systems, some of it's being used, but it's not going anywhere else, right? It's a contained system, so we're not sending that power to another computer that's attached to our spacecraft. So all of the power, ultimately, that's being generated within our spacecraft has to be dissipated as heat eventually. So it will move through different components. Depending on their efficiency, each one will generate some heat, but eventually all of it has to turn into heat. Yeah, because that's just how power works. We can't, you know, energy can't be created or destroyed. It has to go somewhere. So eventually it will all end up as heat. So um, this is the power budget. So I think you're looking at power next week. So you'll look at this in a bit more detail. So this is the power budget for the satellite that the University of Manchester built and operated last year, um, as an example. Uh, and there's a couple of different powers that you'll see on this. And I guess um, you'll talk about this a bit more next week. But just to say, there can be quite a big difference. So peak power is like if everything in the spacecraft was turned on maximum at the same time. Unlikely to happen, but you never know. And there you've got, in this case, 14 watts of power being generated. Duty cycled power is basically thinking about, actually, we're probably only going to turn on this instrument for about 10% of the time, and we're only going to use this for 5% of the time. And so on average, you'll end up with this power, 4 watts, around the whole duration of your orbit. Yes? So duty cycled power is how much power do we, how much of power do we really need for our mission? It's averaged over, it's, it's what we expect to need for our mission averaged over one orbit, for example. But the peak power is the absolute maximum that could happen. And I'll talk a bit about why this is important um, in a little while. What we expect to need for our mission. Yes. Average over one orbit. Yes. Uh, so th the average power here in this case, you'll talk about this next week, so I don't want to dwell too much on it, but the average power here is basically the nominal power that each thing should draw. So if it's working normally, this is the amount of power that it should use, but then you'll see there's this duty cycle number which basically tells you how long it should be turned on as a percentage of time. So you've got something here which is an average power of 5.5 watts, but if it's only on 10% of the time, then over the duration of one orbit, it'll actually only use 0.55 watts. So average power is the nominal power that the craft should use in normal operation. Yes. Okay. Uh, right. So these are the kind of power values. They're in watts. We can just shove them into our equation and move on with our lives. There's no crazy calculations to happen with our power. We just need to take account of them and put them in. Uh, again, I'll talk about this in a little bit. I'm surprised I didn't have a slide on this first. I thought I did. Maybe, oh no, it comes up later. Okay, well, just to confuse matters, we'll do it this order. Um, so this is just to say that if I was doing the thermal analysis on this, I would want an additional uh, column. And my additional column would be minimum power. So uh, I'll talk about why in a little while, but this is basically your worst case if like all your experiments shut down, um, you know, your basically everything's drawing the minimum amount of power, then what is the minimum amount of power that's being dissipated within your spacecraft, and here we get down to 1.8 watts. I'll talk about why that's important, um, but just to show that it can vary massively depending on what's going on within your spacecraft. Okay, and so we shove those in. Uh, we've got all of our values on the left now, all of our energy coming in, and we just need to balance that with the energy going out the far side. So uh, this, to calculate what is being emitted from our spacecraft, we basically use the idea that we assume that space is at zero degrees Kelvin. It's not quite, it's probably at about three, but for purposes of what we're doing, we just assume it's zero. And then we can work out our radiative heat emission. Remember that because our spacecraft is up in space, there's no fluids, we're only radiating heat. There's no conduction, there's no convection. So that makes it really, really simple. And if we had a perfect black body, people have done experiments looking at black bodies um, to basically find out how much heat they emit in different circumstances. And we get this nice guy called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, um, and we multiply that by the temperature to the power of four, and that will tell us how much heat is being radiated from our spacecraft in space. In reality, if it was in, say, a room, so if you were looking at how much heat you were radiating in a room, you actually do the difference between the two temperatures to the power of four. So you might be more familiar with seeing it that way. Um, but in space, we just assume the ambient temperature is zero and move on. Uh, so this is if it was a black body. This is how we would work out how much heat was being radiated. 
Um, but then we need to take into account that emittance factor again, right? So we talked about how we use that emittance term for calculating how much infrared radiation we're taking in. We also use it to work out how much infrared radiation we are emitting out. So it's just the proportion. So if we have an emittance of 0.5, then we're emitting 50% of our heat, and the rest of it we're containing inside the spacecraft. And we also need to account for the area, same as all the other cases, but this time we're emitting from every single surface. Yeah, we're not just emitting towards the Earth, we're not just emitting to deep space, we're not just emitting towards the sun, we are emitting from every surface. Doesn't matter if that surface is pointing towards the sun, we're still radiating from it. Okay, so we need our total area to work out how much heat we're radiating. And that is how we can get this equation to balance and still keep our temperatures in a reasonable region, right? Because in this side of the expression, we've only got one term, but we've got the whole total area to play with. So that helps us to keep us in a reasonably um, balanced circumstance. So our term then becomes this, uh, where we've got our temperature to the power of four, our area, our emittance, and our Stefan Boltzmann constant. When we put this into our equation, we've balanced it now. We know all of these terms. We fill them all in. We get this lovely big expression, but we can then rearrange it to solve for temperature because we know absolutely everything else. The only thing we don't know is the temperature. And that's what we're trying to find. We want to find out how hot or cold our spacecraft is going to be in this scenario. So we rearrange the whole thing, and what you get is something that looks like this. That the temperature in equilibrium, so the steady state temperature, is a qu quadratic root, root to the four, mm -hmm. of the, all the energy coming in divided by your emissivity, your Stefan Boltzmann constant, and your total area. We've got there. Take a minute, and I will take questions. Nope, all happy? Okay, good. Like I said, we covered the worst of it on Monday, so hopefully these ones aren't too bad. Um, and when you work through the quizzes and test this out, it, it will all start to make sense. But I really recommend you do that because sometimes the subtleties of what you need to use, when you need to use emissivities and so on, um, it, it won't click until you start putting them into practice. So I really recommend you take the time to do that. Okay, happy if I move on? Yes, excellent. All right, so this is what I was mentioning earlier about this idea of why do I want a minimum power term? So uh, when you're doing these kind of steady state analyses, there's no point in just doing one because you're just picking a random point in time and you're freeze framing that. Whereas actually your spacecraft's moving, it's probably going into eclipse, it's got things turning on and off, so the temperature is gonna vary over time. And so what we do is we tend to do different cases, different equilibrium cases. So for example, we would start normally with a hot case. And a hot case is basically trying to think, how hot is it possible that my spacecraft can get in the absolute worst case? So in this scenario, when you're calculating your uh, solar energy coming in, you would assume that your maximum area is facing the sun, for example, right? Now, you might have your spacecraft set up so that should never happen, but you never know. Things go wild. So you always want to account for what's the possible worst case. So if your spacecraft has a particularly large side, assume that's facing the sun. That would probably be your worst case. And if you can, also orient things so that you've got the largest face towards the sun as well, or towards the earth as well, so you've got your maximum albedo and your maximum earth IR. And in this case, you would shove in your maximum power as well. So this is, I don't know, something goes bonkers, you get a single event upset or something on your spacecraft, and everything switches on max power for some inexplicable reason, right? So very unlikely to happen, but you just want to see. Uh, other things I've mentioned here, just out of interest, basically, is that somebody mentioned about the variation, uh, somebody mentioned on Monday about the variation in sort of solar intensity that we would experience. So we say 1400 watts per meter squared. That will vary depending on where the Earth is throughout its orbit. Uh, it'll vary depending on where the spacecraft is, vary depending on the sun's mood, all sorts of things. So sometimes we'll put in a slightly higher value here, something like 1450, for example, just to take a worst case. Um, and also for your absorptivity. I mentioned it's quite difficult to, to measure absorptivity. So often for the, the components that you'll buy and the coatings on them, they will give you a range. 
um, or they might give you kind of like an estimate. So sometimes we'll, uh, we'll pump that up a little bit just to give us our worst case. Second case, obviously, cold case, the opposite. So this is what is the worst cold case. What, what, how cold can my spacecraft possibly get if everything goes horribly wrong? So first thing you'll do is you'll put your spacecraft in eclipse, uh, whee, whoops, ah, which means you've no solar energy coming in. It also means you've no albedo coming in because the, uh, so the sunlight reflecting off the Earth is going back that way. So if you're in eclipse, you're not getting any albedo either. You'll probably choose to have your minimum spacecraft surface facing the Earth if you have one. Again, this might never happen in reality, but you're taking the worst case. And you'll use that minimum power. So that was what I was talking about previously, that I would want that minimum power term as a thermal analyst to take it into account. Again, it shouldn't happen, but this, the, the minimum power case is normally when your spacecraft goes into something called safe mode. So if something happens to your spacecraft, normally um, the most likely thing is that you, your spacecraft gets disoriented for some reason and your solar cells are no longer pointing towards the sun properly. What you can do is have it so it automatically goes into this safe mode, which is where it shuts down pretty much everything. So you're not drawing too much energy. You make your battery last as long as possible, and your spacecraft just focuses on picking up communication with the ground. And once you do that, then you can try and work out what's gone wrong and point it in the right direction again. So normally, your lowest power will be your safe mode, which is shutting down as much as possible to conserve energy. So again, hope it doesn't happen, but it's worth looking at. And then you'll also normally do a nominal case. So you'll look at, okay, well, let's just put it in some sort of random position uh, and maybe take an average area. So in this case where you've got multiple surfaces, maybe just take the average of them, for example, um, and take your nominal power, which we talked about. Okay, um, so that's sort of less defined if you want, but it's probably dependent on your mission. You'll have an idea about what operating conditions you expect your spacecraft to be in throughout most of the mission. So that is normally the kind of cases that we would look at. Any questions on that? Yes? For the safe mode and cold, is there any equivalent for hot? Uh, no, we don't really have, uh, like I say, I think the only case where everything would turn on maximum is if you had some sort of upset, uh, computer upset, and it <laughs> accidentally switched a load of things on. Certainly not something that you would program the spacecraft to do under any circumstances. Any other questions? That makes sense? Cool. I don't think this is actually in the notes, so this is more for your interest. Um, great, okay. So, having understood what an equilibrium case is, how we do these equilibrium calculations, and the, the different cases that we might study, why would this be helpful? So, another Menti question to get you thinking. Why would this equilibrium calculation be useful when we know it doesn't really reflect what happens in reality? And again, feel free to chat amongst yourselves. I'm, I'm interested to see what you'll come up with. I always love your answers. You always come up with something I haven't thought of, which is really interesting.
I think you've covered most of the topics. I'll just give you another like 10 seconds. <coughs> Yeah, I'm going I'm to actually take a minute to go through some of these because it's really interesting what you come up with. So the two things that I would think about, um, and actually there's one more that I don't think you've mentioned, so we'll talk about that. But So the two things are, um, basically it simplifies our analysis, right? So it means if we're trying to design a spacecraft and we don't really know yet maybe what kind of orbit it's going to go in, maybe we don't know exactly what instruments it's going to have on board, we're just kind of trying things out. Um, we can do really quick calculations and kind of work out, is this going to be a serious problem or is this kind of going to work? So it lets us do quick calculations so that we can get some sort of first order estimations and use that in the early design phases. So a lot of you have mentioned that. The other thing that a lot of you have mentioned, which is absolutely right, is this gives us a really helpful design envelope. So if we know what are the absolute possible worst case scenarios for how hot it could get and how cold it can get, and we can design our spacecraft to definitely operate within those, uh, within those bounds, then that makes life easy for us because we don't really need to worry about it. We know whatever happens, our spacecraft is never going to exceed the operational survival limits of our components. That's not always possible, but if we can do it, as a lot of you pointed out, that could be a really nice cheap solution because we don't need to put any complex thermal controls in then. We just let it go um, and it's absolutely fine. Um, but it also means that we can kind of keep an eye on which components maybe are at risk and we know that we might want to back those ones up, for example, and have a duplicate um, in the case that something goes wrong. Uh, so I think in the previous uh, thermal limits I showed you, we had two batteries on that spacecraft and that was basically why, because one of them had quite a tight operating range, so we had a backup battery just in case something went wrong. One thing I hadn't thought about that someone's pointed out, uh, in fact a few people have, is um, that actually the impact of the heat on the spacecraft will uh, cause it to expand and contract and it will impact its structural integrity, so putting stresses and strains on the spacecraft um, and that that would obviously inform your structural design as well so that these might be information you could pass to your structural engineer who's on the project. Um, I hadn't thought of that, that's really interesting, I like that. Um, and the other thing, where was it? So somebody said, uh, helps you design a spacecraft for research and I think I don't know exactly what you mean by that but it makes me think of the fact that um, there is something about knowing what temperature your spacecraft is at right so if you want to do certain experiments on board maybe biological experiments in particular for example um, or if you have an instrument that's measuring infrared you really need to know the temperature of your spacecraft quite precisely and um, so that you know those operating conditions so if you want to understand what's going on in your spacecraft that could be quite important as well. So I think that was most of them, um, but thank you, that was really, really interesting. Uh, so as I said, uh, as you said, the thermal limits and designing for those, giving those operational bounds is the most key scenario, but there is one other reason that you didn't mention, which is why we do this, which is when we want to do thermal testing. So predicting the thermal behavior of a spacecraft in orbit is one of the most challenging things to do. It's very, very hard to get accurate readings on it because of all these different variables that we've already talked about. And so one of the things that we do to try and have confidence in our models is that we build a model of our spacecraft as the CAD model of the spacecraft, but designed for a thermal analysis uh, software. And what we do is we model what we think the spacecraft will do in orbit. And then we model what we think the spacecraft will do in a thermal vacuum chamber. So we have thermal vacuum chambers on Earth where we can put the spacecraft in, we take all the air out of the vacuum chamber, we close them up, well, close them up first, then take the air out, uh, and we can heat them up or we can cool them down. And we do this for two reasons. One is to test that the components will actually survive at those temperatures that they say they will and that things don't, for example, if you've got deployable solar arrays, that they don't freeze in place, for example, that all of your structures and mechanisms <coughs> continue to work. Um, but another reason is that we can create a thermal model and do this kind of cold and hot case analysis for what the spacecraft should do in that thermal chamber, right? We do the same calculations, what heat should it give out, what heat should it be receiving from the thermal chamber. And if we see that our temperature of our spacecraft in those tests matches what we're calculating, then we can be pretty sure 
that our models are right and we're taking everything into account. So things like our material properties are accurate. If our calculations say that in the chamber the spacecraft sh temperature should be 10 degrees and it's actually 100 degrees, there's something funny going on, right? So we need to go back and revise our models. So it's very, very hard to make accurate thermal models of spacecraft and it's quite hard to measure accurate, uh, even though we get thermal data from spacecraft on orbit, it's, it's quite hard to correlate those with our models because there's so many variables. So we test them on the ground. So this is another reason that these calculations are quite useful. Okay, so with that, that is all of our thermal analysis stuff. We're now going to jump on to thermal control. So you started off by telling me lots of ways to uh, control the temperature of our spacecraft, opening windows, closing curtains, all that good stuff. So now we're just going to fly through some of those examples um, and maybe tell you about some you hadn't thought of, although I think you pretty much covered most of them. So the first thing just to say, to remind yourself, is when we want to work out how to balance, how to control the temperature of our spacecraft, we've got a few different things in here that we can play with. Um, but the easiest thing to do is that we've got, if you remember all of these terms at the top, the, temp the energy coming in, a lot of them have that absorptivity value in it. And on the bottom, we've got this emissivity value. And obviously we have an emissivity at the top as well for our Earth and for red, right? So we've got these absorptivities and emissivities all over the place. But if we assume that solar radiation is the dominant radiation, because it's 1,400 watts per square meter compared to, say, 250 watts per square meter from Earth IR, then we can simplify this and say that our temperature is proportional to the absorptivity divided by the emissivity, right? Because in our QIN calculation for solar radiation, we've got our absorptivity, and on the bottom here for our uh, energy going out, we've got our emissivity. So we can say that our thermal equilibrium temperature is proportional to these. And what that means is that if we want to increase our temperature, we increase our absorptivity, which makes sense, right? We want to take more energy in to heat our spacecraft up. So we increase how much we're absorbing. Or if we want to cool it down, we increase how much we're emitting, right? So again, it makes, more, it makes sense. We want to cool down, we want to get rid of that heat faster. Um, or vice versa, obviously. If you're emitting less, you'll hold on to more. If you're absorbing less, you'll also cool down. So we can play with those two values to uh, try and um, vary our temperatures. And basically we do that by painting our spacecraft. That is the simplest thing and on the missions that I've worked on, um, obviously there's lots of different things that we can do, but on the ones that I've worked on it tends to be, do you want it black or do you want it white? <laughs> basically is the simple choice, uh, particularly for a lot of things like CubeSats. Um, if we look at our black and white, they both have a similar emissivity value, so they're both letting out the same amount of energy, which is around 0.7 or 0.8. But the white paint will reflect a lot more of that solar radiation. So its absorptivity is much lower, so it will take in less. Um, and our black paint will take in a lot more. Yeah, so it's the same thing that presumably lots of you were told as children, um, that if you wear black clothes on a hot day, you take in more uh, energy and you'll get hotter. And if you wear white clothes, it reflects the heat away. That's basically the idea here. Uh, yes, that's my nice animation that I spent ages on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, right. So to summarize our uh, thermal control options, I've got this lovely graphic, which I hope will uh, help you all to remember them. We basically have two different types of thermal control options. We have passive options and we have active options. Passive options are things that don't require any power. They're just built into the spacecraft and they work at all times. So things like the paint that we just talked about. Active options are things that require power to drive them. So these are the kinds of things that we can turn on and we can turn off. So passive options, the first one I just mentioned is the use of paint or <coughs> radiating surfaces, right? So uh, this is an example of a Meteosat third gen, which is uh, a spacecraft I actually did work on the thermal design for. Um, and it, actually the biggest problem with it was its instrument, um, but because of the way it was oriented, it actually had a face that was always going to be pointing away from the sun, basically, and always into deep space, uh, or at least side onto the sun. And so what we could do is we could choose to have that face as um, sort of a radiator. So you put a material on it that will let out loads of heat, but not take in too much, so something like white paint. And in doing so, then you know that you can always let heat out from one side of the spacecraft. Yes? Paint. Paint. Yeah, it sounds low-tech. It's genuinely what we do. Do we heat slash absorb the coatings? 
Correct. And, and that's it, right? Is there There's more. We're going to go through them one at a time. Okay, so paint. Yes. So there are special, yeah, you don't just go to like B&Q and just like paint your spacecraft. Uh, good question. So there are special companies who make paint for spacecrafts. Um, there's a couple of things that you kind of want. The first is that you want them to be light. Uh, it sounds silly, but even um, paint will add to the mass of your spacecraft. So you want them to be deposited as thinly as possible. Um, and the second thing that you want is that you don't want them to chip and fly off. We talked about in our mission analysis stuff, our orbit mechanics, that our spacecraft are flying at about seven kilometers a second. Even a paint chip at seven kilometers a second can do damage, right? So you don't want bits flying off and crashing into other spacecraft or flying through your solar panels um, or, or landing on your solar panels and coating them. So, um, so yes, so they are made specifically for space. So yeah, paint is probably a little bit of a misnomer, but that's what we called. Okay, the second option for passive um, thermal control is insulation. So literally, like uh, you might have done this morning going out your house because it's a bit chilly, you put on a hat, you put on a jumper, right? And you try and keep the heat that you already have inside your body in and not let it out. Um, and multi-layer insulation is exactly that. So um, basically, multi-layer insulation is, I don't know if you can see, these pictures are in your notes, so you can take a look, but they're kind of a honeycomb structure. Uh, there's multiple layers of this kind of honeycomb structure packed together. And then on either side of it, there's a reflective surface. So it's basically like a blanket, the kind of blanket you might see runners get at the end of a marathon where it's reflective and it's kind of thick. Um, and the idea is to try and basically keep your heat in. So particularly for batteries, batteries are going to be generating quite a lot of power because they're going to be on, they're going to be used quite a lot. So quite often we'll, put, we'll just wrap the batteries in multi-layer insulation if we think there's a risk they could get cold. Um, so that's one of the simplest solutions that we can have. Likewise, for instruments, we'll often pack them in MLI as well. Any questions on those, our two passive options? Yes? The multi-layer insulation is just, is just honeycomb structure, a honeycomb structure coat that's made of... Uh... It's actually made of, uh, I think, the outer layer is Kapton film. I'm not entirely sure what the inside is made of. It might also be Kapton. <laughs> coated in a, in a reflective Kapton film. Okay, so the next one I put at the boundary of passive and active, because you can kind of have it as either. So you get a heat sink and a heat pipe. Um, and I'm not entirely sure about the terminology and where one ends and one starts. But basically, the idea of this is to be able to move heat around your spacecraft, right? So if you have uh, something like a computer that's generating an awful lot of heat, because we don't have convection to move that around our spacecraft, what you can end up is hot spots. So your computer can be absolutely roasting and then something that's not being used very much, like, I don't know, maybe your communication system, if you haven't spoken to the ground for a while, that can get really, really cold. And so what we can do is we can basically use uh, copper wiring or other type of good conductors, so essentially metals, and create links between different components in the spacecraft to help to transfer that heat, draw it away from the hot components, and move it towards the cold components. So that is basically one way of doing it. Um, we can also have a heat sink, which is literally just a block of metal, which we move all our heat towards. Um, and that can kind of, the heat can kind of sit there until our spacecraft goes into eclipse, for example, and then it can radiate out. So where I showed you on the Meteosat, where it had this kind of radiative surface, you would be trying to take all the heat from your components and move it to that radiative surface to get it out that side of the spacecraft. So it's just a way of moving heat around your spacecraft. However, a heat, this only works, obviously, if the thing you're moving it to is colder than the thing that's, that you're moving the heat from, right? So if you have a heat sink, like a block of metal, and it gets hotter than your computer, you can't passively move the heat to that anymore. It's going to start sending its heat back instead. They'll have reached equilibrium. So what we can have are heat pipes, which are these little tubes that we can put in our spacecraft between different components which are actively driven. So they have liquid inside them and that liquid is convected through the pipe to carry heat from one <coughs> side to the other and we can drive that. So a bit like what you get in a fridge basically to try and cool things down. Um, so that's why it can also be active. So these are, uh, if you have to use an active heat pipe, they're quite tricky to design. Um, 
I knew a guy once whose job was just to design these heat pipes and like he did a really good job at it. He got paid extremely well for it, but all he did was design these heat pipes. They're quite tricky to get right. Um, but they could be a really good solution if you have like a very delicate instrument and you need to get the heat away from it very quickly, for example. Uh, we were working on it for that MediaSat instrument. Basically, it had a, an infrared sen sensor on it, and we had to keep it so the temperature didn't vary by more than like 0.5 Kelvin, I think. So it was quite tight. So that was why we had these um, heat loops in to try and take any extra heat away as quickly as possible. All right, active stuff then, purely active. Heater, you can put a heater in, right? Really straightforward. Um, not a, uh, a, a radiator like you'd have at home where it's got liquid running through it, um, but basically you get these kind of, they're like little stickers. So um, quite often, especially in a small satellite like a CubeSat, you can get these little stickers um, which have a metal, like you can see, have these metal coils inside um, the sticker and you can stick them to your battery or underneath your battery or onto any components that you think might get cold and you just put a thermostat on them so it can ten, ten, uh, sense how hot or cold the battery is getting and it will turn on. And in fact, most commercial batteries that you'll buy for CubeSats, for example, will all come with a heater built in because it's just good practice. Yes? So for purely active, I want to simplify it as much as possible. So a sticker-like electric heater with a thermostat. Correct. Excellent. All right, and here's your windows and your curtains, right? So you've got your louvers. Louvers is a fancy word for, basically looks like those, those shutters that you get on windows occasionally, right? It's just things that go up and down. Um, these are what we would use normally on larger spacecraft where we expect to have um, quite varying conditions and we think we're gonna have a lot of heat to deal with. So louvers are basically, they, they are essentially like blinds or like opening the window. So what you basically have is a layer of a material on the bottom, so below these flaps, which has a low absorptivity and a high emissivity. So that will let out loads of heat, right? And then these little uh, slats, which can close to fully cover that material, have a high absorptivity and a low emissivity. So they will take in lots of heat. And so what you can do then is when your spacecraft is getting cold, for example, you close your windows, and it'll start to take in lots of energy because you've got a really absorbing surface. And when your spacecraft gets too hot, you open your windows and you let your heat out. So maybe it's better to say close your curtains, open your windows, whatever way you want to think about it. But that's basically what these things do. And again, you can link them to a thermostat to be able to drive them automatically based on the temperature of your spacecraft. Okay, so that is all of the thermal control elements. Any questions on that? So far, so straightforward? Yep. Okay, good. We've got two minutes left, so I want to really quickly run you through what this full process looks like for thermal design of a spacecraft. Um, as I said, I used to work in this area, so um, I'm quite familiar with it. But uh, I think it feels like a little bit random when you're just doing these hand calculations to work out this equilibrium temperature. So I thought I'd just really quickly run you through what the process actually looks like from start to finish so you can see where this all fits in. So the first thing that we would generally do is we start off with a system model, which is we have an idea of what our spacecraft might look like, where the components are going to be within it. We might do those hand calculations that you're going to have uh, done um, to kind of work out what kind of maximum hot and maximum cold temperatures we might have. <laughs> one of the things we've oft, I also looked at on this one particularly was um, how actually you could rearrange the components inside so that the hot components were at the edge of the spacecraft and the cold components were in the middle, right, to try and keep them warm. So you can do really simple things like that to just reorganize the spacecraft. So you're kind of looking at the very high level, what are our equilibrium temperatures going to look like, are there any hot spots, and what can we do easily to try and solve those problems. Then what you'd normally do is you'd move on to the instrument. So uh, if you've got a payload or a particular component on board that looks like it's going to struggle, um, as I mentioned for MediaSat, it has an infrared instrument on board that's very sensitive to heat. So it needs to be kept at a stable temperature. Um, so you then would do a detailed model of just that instrument by itself and try and work out what kind of conditions it would be exposed to. Um, and the reason you just do the instrument by itself is the spacecraft itself is quite complicated. You can imagine the scale of that CAD model, and if you're trying to do a detailed model, it gets quite difficult. So you focus in on the bits that you think are going to be tricky, 
and you do a detailed analysis. So I think for your MATLAB, you're going to be looking at how your uh, temperatures change throughout the cycle of an orbit, for example, taking into account eclipse. So that's the kind of model we would be doing for these instruments. So trying to look in detail, how do we actually expect them to behave? And then we take those detailed models and we plug them back into our spacecraft, right? So we kind of estimate, or we kind of approximate the results that we have and we plug them back in and we do a detailed analysis of the whole spacecraft looking at how it behaves through its whole orbit, but also how it's going to behave in our thermal tests, which we do next. So now we have an idea of how we expect it to behave in orbit. I think we're happy with that. We work out how we expect it to behave in a test chamber. We put it into the test chamber and we check that it actually does what we think it should do. Because if it behaves how it should in the test chamber, we can be pretty sure it's going to behave how we expect on orbit. And then the last stage then is that we monitor it once it's on orbit. So most spacecraft will have some sort of temp uh, thermometers on board, which are taking measurements at different points around the spacecraft, um, and they'll send those down as part of their telemetry, so their general <coughs> housekeeping data to tell you how things are going on. Um, this is some work that I did at the Space Agency, which was quite fun, um, because I looked at a lot of CubeSats that had been um, launched by student groups, and basically a lot of them broke, and they thought maybe it was to do with the temperatures, so I was looking at their various temperatures to try and work out was that actually the problem. Um, and as I say, it's quite a difficult thing to actually analyze because you don't have a lot of data points. Things are changing quite quickly, so it's very difficult to know. Um, but the best thing about it was that some of the, the CubeSats were programmed to send quite fun messages when they broke. <laughs> so this was one from a Polish satellite um, which said that it had been uh, contacted by aliens, uh, the mothership was present, atmosphere incineration was imminent, resistile, resistance is futile, and long live Dr. Kurek, who I believe was one of the academics at the university who supported the project. Um, and after that, it burned up. <laughs> it died. <laughs> that was the end of it. Um, so that was quite a nice message to get. Um, and so that is basically the life cycle of a spacecraft through the thermal testing cycle. So hopefully you found that interesting. Um, you are now officially free to go. Um, and I won't see you next week. Kate's going to be doing the power subsystems. So uh, look forward to that. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. So actually, funnily enough, 
yeah. after you emailed me, um, I got an email like straight away from the university about setting up okay, internships. I do, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I saw it on Blackboard, but then it like, disappeared. So I was like, I don't know exactly what you did. Yeah, so, yeah, so basically they've come to me and said, do you want to do it again?